Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our FOCA Cardiac Safe Communities and your association Lunch and Learn webinar hosted by FOCA and Action First Aid. I'd like to start this meeting by recognizing and thanking the traditional stewards of the lands and waterways where we work and live. The waterfront lands of Ontario are the traditional territories of many diverse Indigenous peoples uh, who recognize the sacredness of water, the interconnectedness of all life, and the importance of protecting land and water for the generations yet to come. We're all on a journey toward truth and reconciliation, and we offer this recognition as an important step in that journey. We're joining this virtual meeting today from different locations, and I encourage each of you to dedicate yourselves to move forward in the spirit of respect, reciprocity, learning, and sharing that learning. Uh, my name is Michelle Lewin, and I'm FOCA's Manager of Communications and Development. I want to just give you a couple of technical notes about Zoom. First of all, if you experience technical glitches with the audio or the video, really your best bet is to close the Zoom window out entirely and re-enter using the link that we were sending you originally. Um, you're muted in the Zoom webinar format. If you mouse over your screen or click if you're on an iDevice today, you should be able to open the chat portal where you can type a message to the presenters. Um, and uh, I want to let you know that this meeting is being recorded and that you will receive a copy of both the slides and the recording link after the event in a follow-up email tomorrow. Now I'd like to uh, introduce FOCA's Executive Director, Terry Reese, who's going to give you a few positioning words about FOCA and why this topic is so important to our membership. Terry. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, we have uh, well over 100 people registered for today's event, obviously in a, a topic of great importance to many of us. And thank you for spending part of your day with us today. Uh, some of you are familiar with FOCA. Many of you are members or supporters, and we thank all of you for your ongoing support. Some of you may be less familiar with who we are and what we do. Uh, so I thought I would take a few minutes to provide a brief introduction uh, to FOCA. So we're celebrating our 60th year this year. We're very excited about that. We've had 60 years of volunteerism across uh, the province of Ontario, looking out for the interests of our waterfronts and waterfront residents. Uh, we've currently got 525 member associations from Kenora to Cornwall, uh, representing 50,000 member families. So lots of people with a shared interest in uh, sustainable and resilient waterfronts. Uh, if you don't know about the member benefits about uh, being involved with FOCA, we do have an annual membership uh, that we count on to support the work that we do on your behalf. So we have a number of member discounts on liability insurance, both for your local association, but also for your home cottage and boat and other property. So we'd encourage you to have a look at that. We've got a legal helpline for the associations, a number of special member only events and uh, all the information uh, that you'll learn about in the next couple of minutes while I speak about FOCA uh, is available uh, on behalf of uh, members and our supporters. We've got a vision of thriving and sustainable waterfronts and that's a broad mandate, but we it is about promoting healthy lands, lakes and rivers, making sure we have strong community groups in our communities. We advocate on your behalf for responsive, responsive and responsible government for the various policies that impact our life, our livelihood, and our well being at the lake. And we help to champion affordability and safe living. And the safe part is about uh, a lot about what we're going to be talking about today. So we are an advocate on your behalf. So we do speak to government on the issues that are uh, priorities across the, across the gambit. Uh, and that impact waterfront communities and waterfront residents. So we go to government to speak on various issues. A couple of the hot ones we've listed here, which include uh, the attacks on non-resident uh, owners, the emerging challenge around floating accommodations on our waterways, and a big uh, issue which is continuing to impact us is changes to the way we do land use planning in Ontario. That's related to the recent Provincial Bill 23 and related regulations. So stay tuned. That's something we're watching very carefully. We do a number of programs that support our members and our interests, a lot of them around the water quality and environment, programming around uh, Phragmites and the Green Shovels Collaborative, sampling for invasive species that I sample on, monitoring for Asian carps, 
our longstanding program around so water quality monitoring, 30 plus years across the province, the Lake Partner Program. And we also have a cottage succession series that's all about keeping your family cottage in your family, important uh, things to consider as we go forward. Much of our information is available for free and through our website. And that's on a variety of topics, which I've mentioned, including the emerging challenges around short-term rentals, uh, managing our septic systems, wake awareness, et cetera. So do have a look at our website for any of those. Just a little bit about our community and why this issue today in particular is interesting. Although we think maybe three quarters of people have four seasons access to your, to your property, we know that generally we're far away from medical services and, and services in generally. So uh, it's important to realize that we're self-reliant and need to be looking out for ourselves at, at our homes and our cottages. Many of us are on private roads and that adds another element to accessibility. And more than 10% of us are on an island, which means you're on your own and we better look after ourselves. So we do spend a lot of time about emergency preparedness uh, and speaking to issues around the, uh, about being resilient on your waterfront. Excuse me. So in our journey to these uh, safe and sustainable waterfronts, we talk about, sorry, thank you, Michelle. We talk about fire safety, about flooding, wildfire prevention safety, risk management, boating safety, extreme weather, power outages, and being personally prepared to protect your family's health and well-being. So that's why uh, we are really pleased to present this um, during Emergency Preparedness Week, by the way, uh, which the theme is this year, Safe, Practiced, and Prepared Ontario. Uh, we're bringing you our great uh, friends from Action First Aid. They've been supporting communities and families by delivering first aid, CPR, and AED training uh, across uh, the province. And they've been a focus sponsor for seven years. So we're much, very much appreciative of their good information and of their ongoing support for us and our community. Um, we appreciate all the services they provide. They've, well, they've helped many of our member associations with AEDs and uh, uh, first aid training. So I'm pleased to introduce Deb Henning. She's a former high school phys ed and science teacher, but has been a leader in the first aid CPR and AED industry in Canada for over 25 years. Uh, she's president and program director of the, one of the largest private CPR and training agencies and leads a team of over 75 instructors uh, and always leads uh, is always committed to delivering an interactive training experience, helping organizations large and small to deliver AED programs. So without further ado, over to you, Deb, and you can introduce your team. Okay, let's just first of all get this camera going. Um... Video. Okay, can everybody see me okay? I think so. Looks All great. Right. Thanks so much, uh, Terry um, and Michelle. And yeah, that's amazing. I can't believe it's seven years. I was trying to think of how long it's been, but um, um, I think that um, it, it's incredible too to think that we have over 100 people. And that really just goes to show you the awareness that's been building. Because I think when we first started this, there maybe was, you know, it, um, people didn't even realize that you could think about getting an AED for your for your cottage or for your home. So now I think we've we've really come a long, long way, but uh, we're excited to kind of address you and um, share with you some, I think some really, really important um, pieces of information and education just about how important and how critical it is to really think about uh, your cottage and even your home and make sure that you are truly cardiac safe. So I'll be doing the first half of the presentation and then uh, Katricia will be coming in for the second half. Um, so Katricia, um, I guess you can introduce yourself at that point. And then John is always with us and has been with us for years. And he is, uh, he's an instructor himself. Um, and, but he's also our technical expert, especially when it comes to the outdoor side of placing AEDs, which is a very exciting new area of, uh, of protecting people. Okay, so uh, I think I'll probably jump over to the presentation and uh, walk you through the first part of this. So I think I'll share my screen. Um, Michelle, okay, just a second. Okay, so Michelle, just give me the, the is ever That's yeah? perfect. Yeah, you're in great shape. Okay, perfect, perfect. Before I start, I think the only the other thing I'm going to mention, as Terry said, we've been running a company for 25 years. We're based out of Barrie. We do sell defibrillators across Canada. Um, we've been training people 
primarily in Ontario, but we do go into other provinces as well. Um, and we're starting to place outdoor safe stations throughout the US as well. But most of the people that come to our training, it's interesting. Um, I think everybody understands how important it is to know CPR, but very, very, very few people ever sign themselves up for a course. It's usually the people that are coming through our doors are there because they have to. Um, they're mandated from a government perspective to have a certain number of people trained um, in first aid. But so that's why I think this seminar is even um, that much more exciting for us is that you guys are all here because you understand how important it is to start thinking about this. So thank you for taking the time and I hope you find uh, our presentation uh, really informative. Okay, and there will be time for questions and answers at the end. So I think start to finish, we might be 25 minutes and then that gives us good time for, for question and answer. Okay, so we're here to talk to you about basically how do you, uh, how do you create kind of a cardiac safe cottage or a cardiac safe cottage community. Uh, I think it's really important just to remind everybody or address again that uh, sudden cardiac arrest is truly a major global issue and the majority of people that suffer sudden cardiac arrest, um, it's really in the home or the cottage. Um, and so we, we're, we're not in a position really to rely on, on uh, medical services at that point. Um, when it comes to sudden cardiac arrest, time is absolutely everything. And we just wanna make sure everybody really understands the minute somebody goes into sudden cardiac arrest and we're gonna differentiate that from somebody having a heart attack. But when somebody suffers sudden cardiac arrest, that is when somebody often without any warning sign collapses suddenly. Um, and from the time that person collapses to the time there's basically zero chance, we have 10 minutes. Um, after four minutes, brain damage starts to set in. And then by the 10 minute mark, there's basically permanent irreversible brain damage. So it's really what we do in the first 10 minutes that completely make the difference between life and death when you're dealing with sudden cardiac arrest. Um, we do want to kind of make sure we explain the difference on this webinar um, when you actually need an AED. So the minute somebody collapses, we need immediate CPR and we also need access to an AED. But we're just going to take a few minutes to differentiate between um, the difference between somebody having a heart attack and somebody who's in sudden cardiac arrest. Okay, so um, somebody who's experiencing a heart attack, which is the slide on the left here, the person is still conscious, they're still breathing, they're still talking to us. Um, that's when we have a chance to potentially get signs and symptoms. Um, potentially it's pain in the chest, pain in the shoulders. It could be pain in the upper back. Um, often somebody's sweating. Um, nausea is a very classic sign of a heart attack. Indigestion is also another really um, common sign and it's more often women that would present that indigestion like um, symptom versus the stabbing, squeezing, crushing chest pain that typically more men would experience. Um, trouble breathing is obviously a very classic sign as well. Um, they could be lightheaded and then denial is such a big one. So whether we're at home, at work, at a cottage, any one possible sign of a heart attack, we really have to act pretty quickly. Uh, strongly recommended aspirin at that moment. Um, uncoated aspirin, as long as you're safe to take aspirin um, while you wait for EMS to arrive. So again, if you're at the cottage, you suspect somebody or yourself is potentially having a heart attack, you're always calling 911, um, you're putting yourself in a comfortable position or them, uh, they typically would not want to lay flat on their back because that often um, presents trouble breathing. And so, um, and then suggesting one adult dose of uncoated aspirin is strongly recommended while you wait for help to come. Sudden cardiac arrest, on the other hand, is when you have somebody who has now gone completely unresponsive. And um, in, a, in a full on training course, we would teach you how you want to determine are they responsive? Are they speaking to you? Um, and in the event that they're not responding to you, we check, are they breathing? If somebody's not breathing, that's really our number one sign that they're most likely in sudden cardiac arrest. They require immediate CPR and they really need that AED under 10 minutes. 
Okay, so the one thing I'm also going to mention as well is, um, and again, without knowing everybody on this webinar, it's it's often triggers a lot of emotion because if you've ever been beside somebody who's in the situation, it's very traumatic. Um, or if you've witnessed somebody pass away, they often present agonal breathing, and that's something we have to kind of mentally be prepared for. Is that somebody in sudden cardiac arrest will often present um, agonal breathing? So it's that gasping kind of breathing pattern. Sometimes people describe it as it's like a seizure. They think someone's having a seizure. Sometimes people can posture and they're, you know, you can you can actually see their body moving in, in unusual ways. But your job at that point would be to determine, are they breathing normally? And if you can ascertain from that, that yeah, no, it does not look like this person is breathing normally, you immediately want to begin CPR. Um, Patricia is going to do a quick demo on that later here. Um, and then you really need to get that AED on that person, ideally in under four minutes. Okay. Um, I think it's really important to just to call out the fact that a lot of people think of this happening just to older people, but sudden cardiac arrest, it's truly an electrical issue in the heart and it, it does affect young kids as well. So there's countless tragic stories of young children at schools and, and sports fields that have, um, have died suddenly from sudden cardiac arrest and having access to a defibrillator is really their only chance. So really important we realize this can happen to anybody at any time, any age, unfortunately. Um, we're here to talk about the cottage, but I did wanna call out that even in a neighborhood, we're starting to put um, save stations on the outside of homes, right in the heart of a, of a neighborhood. And it's an amazing thing that we're doing. Um, it's bringing a group of people together. Um, it's protecting, you know, often a large number of people 24 seven. And so that's an example of a home in Barrie where somebody placed one on the side of their home we went and had a backyard kind of CPR party in about an hour. We had everybody learn how to do CPR. And now that defibrillator is available to anybody 24 seven. And Katricia later in this webinar, will talk to you about how you could place something like this on the side of a cottage or a boathouse as well, if, uh, if you have power and if you wanna kind of bring a group of people together. So that's one option. Um, but again, we're, we're thinking about the cottage and that's often when people realize, okay, I'm isolated. There's no way no, anybody's going to get to us down that cottage road in uh, sometimes even 30 minutes, we'd, we'd be lucky. So, so basically um, at the cottage, it really does come down if you really want to be prepared to survive, to have a chance of surviving. It means having an AED either personally invested in your cottage or thinking about putting it in an area that a group of people can have access to. Um, I think it's just inherently obvious that the time for EMS to arrive is just often completely impossible to get there in 10 minutes. Um, and uh, some of the other things too that we also have identified is that having an AD is one thing, but we really also are here and committed to empowering you and your family to know how to use it once you do invest in this life-saving device. Um, Terry, as you said, I heard you say 10% of your members are on islands and that again creates another big challenge. So um, we've found that we've had some really effective um, placements where it's put on an island and a group of people come together. And then you really at that time too also start thinking about what is our plan? How do we actually start, you know, where are our landmarks? Where are we gonna tell EMS to arrive? So it's, um, it's really encouraged to to bring your island together and, and think about how are you going to access help and where should EMS actually meet you um, so that you can you know connect the dots um, when every second matters. So there's really three pillars I think required to save a life. We we absolutely need to think about access and AEDs ideally within four minutes time. Um, up until the last few years, we really weren't able to put AEDs outside, but now we are with this technology, this safe station kind of technology. And then once you've placed them, really it's about driving awareness, making sure that everybody knows where your closest AED is. So again, even if it's at your own cottage, when you have guests come, 
your family members, make sure you don't forget about it. Um, don't put it away in a closet and forget about it. Make sure it's something that's top of mind and that people know about it. And then education, we've, we've built out an incredible bank of tools that we can share with you that are free to use. And then we also provide training, but um, it's really, really important. AEDs are easy to use, but the situation is not easy. Um, someone is clinically dead and every second matters. So we really wanna help everybody feel confident to step in and um, do something until medical help arrives. Um, so basically there's a couple options, like we said, you can purchase an AED just for your own cottage, or you can come together in a group. So the AEDs for your cottage, let's see what this next. Um, Katricia, I think I'll, I'm gonna leave this to you. Okay, uh, Katricia is gonna show you basically uh, we found on the last webinar, a lot of people said, well, how do you even use one? So we wanted to make sure that we show you basically just how easy a defibrillator is to use. So Katricia is set up to do that. Um, and then we have built out a, a real bank of videos that depending on which AED you purchase, um, you can actually access these videos on our YouTube channel and familiarize yourself um, with how to use it and what that AED would actually sound because they do speak to you. Thanks, Deb. Hi, everybody. Can, a safe can station know? houses an automated external. Patricia, just give me one. I thought second. you said I was going to do the demo, Deb. <laughs> you, you are going to do the demo, but I'm almost done. So, you know what? Let me get to one more slide and then I'm going to totally pass it off to you. That's okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm just going to finish with this piece. So, whether you buy an AED for indoors your at your cottage and it's just protecting your family or you choose to bring a group together this has been a really really fun thing that we've introduced and they're called shock on the dock and um you know this video down here shows a group of people on a dock and it took about an hour and everybody was welcome that was an island actually and um so that's part of our solution is placing one inside but then also bringing a group of people together to train and that might be my last slide, so just give me one. Oh, just one sec. And yeah, we mentioned just the additional resources we have um, following up. But I think, Katricia, I'm going to pass it over to you. Um, and you can just let everybody know basically how to use that AED. So I'll stop sharing. You can leave your slides up, Chris. Oh, oh, that's fine. Okay, no problem. I think it'll uh, make um, your display a little easier if we put you perhaps just on, I'm going to put you on speaker view so people can see you a little larger. Great. Um, thank you so much for having me, everybody. My name is Katricia Gellis. I've been working with Action First Aid for just about three years now. I am a CPR instructor, and um, I have been working uh, specifically on um, helping organizations, communities, uh, not-for-profits, grassroots organizations, placing defibrillators outside across North America. So that's really um, something I've become passionate about. Before I do the demo, I'm gonna share a quick story with you. Um, when I was 30 years old, I was at work, I was eating lunch, and all of a sudden, I, my, my colleagues who were with me told me the story because I don't remember this part. I collapsed suddenly and I stopped breathing and they did everything that you are supposed to do and they saved my life and today I'm alive uh, without brain damage because they followed three simple steps call push shock and I'm going to do a demo for you today um, about how to use an AED and how to call push and shock if someone um, is in sudden cardiac arrest so in my case my colleagues saw me fall unconscious they checked that I was not breathing um, and they checked that I was unconscious and they called 911 right away. One of them started to do chest compression. So they started to push on my chest and they pumped the blood through my body. They kept the blood flowing to keep all my organs um, oxygenated and mainly my brain. And so uh, in my case, I was very lucky. Unfortunately, there was no AED on site, but there was a team of firefighters that happened to be driving by around the corner and they got my call. So they got there within two minutes they applied the defibrillator to my chest here and here. Um, they pressed the shock button. It delivered a shock through my heart. It stopped my abnormal heart rhythm. And then combined with CPR, it allowed my heart to restart. And I was able to breathe on my own and they saved my life. So if you are um, not familiar with an AED, with CPR, even if you were to witness someone and just follow these three simple steps, witness them uh, collapse and stop breathing, as long as you are remembering call, push, shock. Um, if you've never used a defibrillator before, if you've never done CPR before, you don't need to be trained. You don't need a certification. Anyone can do it. Um, it's obviously 
more helpful if you do take a course or if you watch some videos to show you um, what to do and re refresh this in your memory because it's best to feel confident and prepared in such an emergency because it's a high stress situation. So I will show you this today as a little demo um, and hopefully it'll be helpful um, for everybody. So I'm just gonna set myself up here. Have my mannequin friend here. To make sure everybody can see this. Yeah, I might get you to tilt that down a little. Oh, perfect. There we go. And I have um, an AED. So AED stands for Automated External Defibrillator. I have two different models here today um, to show you. Um, and the key is, is that all you have to do is, they all work a little bit differently, but the key is that you're just pressing the on button and listening to the instructions and looking at where it tells you to place the pads. So I'm gonna just use this defibrillator today. This is called the Philips Heart Start on-site defibrillator and it's very simple to use. I also have a little response kit here that comes with an AED. So inside you will find everything you need to respond. You have scissors to cut off the person's clothing. If it's a woman, cut off everything, even the bra, and you bare the chest. We have gloves that you can put on to protect yourself. We have um, a little paper towel and also an alcohol wipe as well. If the person is wet or sweating, then you do need to dry them off because the pads of the defibrillator uh, won't stick if uh, the person is, is wet. You also have a razor that you'd use to shave if ever there was um, a hairy part on them where you needed to put the pads so that they can stick properly. And lastly, we have um, what we call a pocket mask. This pocket mask has a one-way valve. So you pop it up, you're breathing in here, the air goes in, but nothing, no vomit, no blood, no anything can go up um, onto, onto you. If it's a person that you're comfortable to put your mouth on, like a family member um, or a loved one or somebody that you are comfortable to put your mouth on, then you can do rescue breathing. But hands-only CPR is also something that you can do as well. So I'm just gonna do a quick demo for you. So if I see someone suddenly collapse or I come across someone and they are on the ground, the first thing I wanna do is check and make sure it's safe for me to approach. So make sure there's no dangers, no fire, no wire, no gas, no glass. And I make sure that I'm safe. So as long as it's safe to approach, I check for consciousness. Excuse me, excuse me, can, can you hear me? I can tap on their shoulders. I can shout their name. Um, I can touch their earlobes. I can clap like this. As long as uh, they're not responsive, they're considered unconscious. My name is Trisha, can I help you? they're not responding to me. So that's called implied consent. Um, I would right away ask someone to call 911. Excuse me, you in the blue shirt, do you have a cell phone? Can you call 911? Tell them there's an unconscious person here. Then I would check for breathing. So the way to check for breathing is you wanna put one hand on the forehead, two fingers under the chin, and you wanna tilt the head up to open the airway. And you wanna look, listen, and feel. So I look and see if the chest is rising and falling. I can listen and I can feel for 10 seconds. One, two, three, 10. If I do not look, uh, hear or see or feel normal signs of breathing, this person is considered unconscious and not breathing. Deb mentioned the agonal gasping. This is really important to recognize within the first couple minutes of a collapse, the agonal gasping and those posturing movements are the body's last ditch effort to try and survive. The brain will be telling the body to breathe, but it can't. So the person may look like a fish out of water. They may be opening and gasping their mouth. Um, and it will be a really kind of a situation that you may have never seen before. They may be even moving and even their eyes might be open and they might wet themselves. So really important things to know if that happens. It's scary, but it's okay because you know what to do. We're gonna call push and shock. So we've called 911 and tell them that the person is unconscious and not breathing. Then we want to push. So we're gonna do chest compression. All we have to do is put your hands on the side of the chest, pull your hands up to under the armpits and draw a line to the center of the chest. Put one hand on top of the other, right in the center of the chest. And we're gonna push down 
hard and fast. Um, you can do it to the beat of a song called Staying Alive, which I, I'm sure everybody knows. Um, so we want to do compression to the beat of Staying Alive. And I, I need someone to go grab the AED from inside the cottage. And I've called for the AED. So I've called, I'm pushing. And as soon as the AED gets here, I'm going to turn it on and use it. So I'm doing my chest compression. If I'm breathing, I do 30 compression, lock the nose, tilt the head back and do two breaths. Breath, breath. And I keep alternating. As soon as the AD arrives, I'm going to turn it on and I'm going to use it. So I'm just gonna use this um, training device today just to show you the pad placement. So when you're applying the pad, you want to apply one at the top right and one at the left side of the body. And what it's going to do is the AED is going to analyze the heart rhythm. It's going to determine if the person needs a shock. And if they need a shock, then the AED will shock. It will go through the heart and it's going to stop the abnormal heart rhythm. And combined with CPR, it's going to allow the heart to restart normally. So this is what it's going to look like. Closing if needed. So I would have already done that. When patient's chest is bare, remove protective cover and take out white adhesive pads. So I'm going to pull this. When patients look carefully at the pictures on the white adhesive pad, and I'm going to take the one pad from the yellow plastic liner. The pads out. So one look goes carefully at the pictures on the white adhesive pad. Feel one pad from the yellow plastic liner. Look carefully at the pictures on the white adhesive pad. Place pad exactly as shown in the picture. Press firmly to patient's bare skin. When the first pad is in place, no one should touch the patient. Everybody stand clear. Nobody Analyze. touch the patient. Everybody stand clear. No one should touch the patient. Analyzing. Doc advised, stay clear of patient. Press the black and orange button. I'm clear, you're now. clear, everybody's clear. I'm shocking now. Doc delivered. Be sure emergency medical And then I'm gonna start, continue my CPR. Begin CPR. For help with CPR, the black and blue button. Place the heel of one hand in the center of the chest between the nipples. Place your other hand on the top of the first. Push the chest down firmly two inches. Keep timing with the beat. So I'm just gonna turn it off now. <laughs> so I'm not gonna continue in the interest of time. But what will happen is it's gonna walk you through two minutes of CPR. So that would be roughly 30 compressions to two breaths five times. And then it's gonna tell you to stop. It's gonna analyze the heart rhythm again, and it's gonna determine if it can give another shock. And you're just gonna continue CPR with shocks. And the idea is that the person's heart will be able to restart and you're gonna to start to see signs of life. They're gonna to start to breathe on their own. Um, and uh, the person may or may not regain consciousness right away. If they do regain consciousness, it's very important to keep them calm uh, and at rest until emergency medical services arrives because they are now very, very uh, unstable. And if they collapse again um, and stop breathing and become unconscious again, then you keep the pads on them and you can use the defibrillator again because the pads are a one-time use thing. So do not uh, take them off. So hopefully that was a good crash course in, in five minutes or less. Um, if anyone has, has questions, um, we will definitely address them at the end. I see one here related to this, will it shock more than once? And the answer is yes, it can shock as many times as needed. It will do the five cycles of CPR and then analyze and deliver a shock. And then you do the CPR and you alternate.
So let me just share my screen now. Deb, do you have anything to add to that? That was fabulous, says Michelle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I agree. Great. So I'm just gonna share a presentation for you and I'm gonna start uh, to tell you a little bit about um, the outdoor side of um, AED placements. Just wanna make sure that I can see, can see my screen here. I put this into a slide. All right. So when it comes to placing an AED outside, there's a couple different options that you can um, look at doing. And they are powered options if there's a location where there is power. And also if there's a location where there's no power, you can still put an AED outside. There's a lot of considerations um, that we have sort of put together for you that we've discovered um, doing this for about seven years in North America that are best practices to make sure the AED has the greatest chance of being ready for rescue. So if you're looking at placing an AED on the side of a cottage or a boathouse or some sort of existing building and there is power, you could look at doing um, one of the two top ideas, which is the safe station standard or the safe station wall mount. And the standard is a very, very um, visible cost-effective way to put an AED outside. Um, the wall mount is a little bit um, more visible in the sense that the top has a light that says AED and safe station and the bottom has a space to put a QR code that links to a video and uh, a decal that says you have the power to save a life or a custom message. These cabinets themselves at a very minimum are climate controlled. So ventilation for the summer and heating for the winter. It's equally important to keep the AED cool in the summer as it is uh, warm in the winter. A lot of, I think, people don't really consider the heat, um, but the AED manufacturers, depending on which AED, usually they, they suggest that you keep them between freezing and 50 degrees Celsius. So the fan will ventilate in the summer and the heating pad will make sure the AED battery um, is snug against the heating pad and will keep it um, warm. If you're looking at placing um, an AED in a location where there isn't really uh, any building, but there's lots of people, so maybe like um, a boat launch, um, a soccer field, a park, places like that, then you still have the option to do a climate controlled cabinet, but it's in a standalone tower. So all of those options here, um, the bottom left is the, the tower that you can see, those all have climate controlled cabinets and they all require power. If you do want to have an additional um, security feature, then the cabinets themselves have the ability to add in uh, remote monitoring that works on a cellular network with a SIM card. And what happens is that if the cabinet's opened, if the AED is removed, it will take a picture, it will send an alert, and it will advise you that something uh, is going on. And if something goes wrong with the AED, if for some reason the pads and batteries, um, they, you know, you, they're, they're no good anymore, and someone forgot to replace them, which hopefully doesn't happen, <laughs> but, um, if it does happen or if it gets too cold or too hot or something's wrong, then you are able to get an alert so you can go address it and make sure the AED is ready for rescue. The last option would be a non-powered option on the bottom right. So if you have a place where you have um, more of like a three season placement, there's nobody there in the winter time, but maybe like a May to October um, situation, this would be like cottages, um, golf courses, places like that. Then what you can do is put the AED inside a waterproof mobile case and you can hang it on the wall or on a post inside of a really protective hut that we call it. Um, and that also has the ability to add in a monitoring feature as well. And that one does not require power. The features of the cabinet, um, as I mentioned at the very minimum, you see at the top there, ventilation and heating are standard. So those are important for our North American climate. All the cabinets are alarmed. So it's a very, very loud alarm that will go off if anyone opens it. That kind of serves two purposes. It deters people who aren't supposed to open the cabinet uh, from doing it. We've seen people open them and run away as soon as the alarm goes off. And it also helps draw attention if there's an emergency. And then the monitoring feature that I mentioned has a camera. So we'll take a picture and send remote alerts to you. On the bottom right, you see the Safe Station Go device. That is um, an option for a ventilated and heated cabinet or uh, a waterproof mobile case. What you can do is you can have the Safe Station um, go monitor the AED 
it'll do the same thing that it sends alerts if something's wrong. But in addition, it has a button that you press and it calls 911. And it also has a GPS tracking device. So those are just some of the features that we have included in the Safe Station Outdoor line that we feel are important to make sure that the AED has the greatest chance of being um, ready for rescue. I wanted to share a really um, important story with you. This gentleman here and this woman on the left there, you see the picture of them. They both lost somebody very special to them um, from cardiac arrest. He lost his best friend and she lost her son. And so together they started foundations to honor their memory and uh, raise awareness for the importance of AEDs and, and doing CPR. And they placed a safe station tower with an AED at a soccer field just outside of Seattle, Washington. In June of last year, a little girl named Nina was playing soccer, she's 12 years old. She had an undiagnosed heart condition. She collapsed, she stopped breathing and was unconscious and everything happened um, in her favor that day. So they started CPR, they got the AED, they called 911 and they saved her um, life. And this is Nina in the middle. So that's her with her parents um, and the people that placed the safe station. And they actually placed another one at that same complex on the other side so that the whole complex is protected now. So that's uh, a little ribbon cutting event that they did to, uh, to honor her. The other uh, story I wanna tell you is um, the second save that we saw from an outdoor safe station. This happened two weeks after Nina, and this was in Sonoma. Um, this is a boy named Mikey. And um, the story goes that a woman named Christy lost her son, unfortunately, while he was playing basketball when he was 16 years old, a couple years ago. In his memory, she started placing AEDs and teaching people CPR and doing heart screenings for kids. And she wanted to place AEDs at her local high school. So she donated four AEDs to a high school in Sonoma. One of them was placed in a safe station tower at a basketball court. And um, at around nine o'clock uh, on an evening in June, Mikey was playing basketball with three friends. He collapsed and stopped breathing. His friends saw the AED, they started CPR, they called 911, they used it and they saved his life. And he's alive today because of that. The special part of the story is that his name is Mikey and the woman's um, son who she lost was also named Mikey and he was playing, they were both playing basketball at the time. So it was a really, really special um, story. Putting AEDs outside, um, there's a different price range that you can look at depending on which unit you're looking at. Obviously funding can definitely be a challenge. So we have some strategies for you um, and for all of our um, all of our customers to be able to uh, raise funds to do this. So one is corporate sponsorship and the other is crowdfunding. So with a sponsorship, if you find a local business, maybe it's a marina, maybe it's a real estate agent, some business that wants to do something good in the community, they can fund the placement of a safe station and an AED and they can get some great exposure to show that they're investing in the health and safety of their community. The other option is crowdfunding. So we have a tool that's ready to use on our safe station website we would give you um, some guidance on which AED and safe station to uh, look at placing depending on where you wanna put it. And then we would give you a goal and you would start the campaign and you can go um, to your network and community. Everybody can give a little bit and then you can fund the placement of this outdoor safe station. This is a quick story of a family that unfortunately lost their father to sudden cardiac arrest. On the anniversary of his death, they decided to start a crowdfunding campaign in his memory. They wanted to place one AED. Within 24 hours, they had doubled their goal. And by two weeks, they had enough to place four safe stations in their community. So this is them with their grandparents at um, the ribbon cutting event for uh, the safe station honoring their father. And this is another family that it was a similar story. They lost their father um, together with their hockey team. They raised money and placed this at a local park where the family uh, lives to commemorate him. I'm gonna, um, we're gonna send these out at the end of the presentation. These are some great awareness videos that Deb was talking about before. We have videos that show how to use every AED on the market as a little refresher. And we have a video that shows what CPR actually does in the body. and how an AED works. So I will encourage everybody to watch these. I think they're excellent to explain the importance of this life-saving um, intervention. Before I uh, pass it back, I just wanna address a couple common questions that come up and I'm sure many of you have. I haven't looked at the chat, but I'm, I'm imagining there are some questions like this in the chat and uh, in, in the, that people will wanna ask. So the first question, uh, well, the first thing to, to, that I just wanna mention is when we're placing AEDs outside, there are things that do need to be considered um, more than if you place an AED inside. So the first thing is, 
obviously security and climate. So in regards to security, people do ask about what happens if it's stolen and what happens if it's vandalized. I just want to point out that these outdoor cabinets, um, there are thousands of them being placed uh, in Europe already. And um, this, the, the rate of vandalism and theft is, is way less than 1%. There, they just aren't stolen or vandalized very much. Um, in North America, we've placed about 500, and I think we've seen two that were stolen. So they are, it can happen. It's definitely um, something to consider. The monitoring piece um, that you can add will definitely address that. So if you are concerned, um, if it is an area where there, there is a concern about that, then having the monitoring is a crucial part of this. Um, and I think that something important to think about is what is a worst scenario if an AED is stolen or if there's no AED there when someone needs it. Um, temperature is important. We talked about that. The AED does need to be within a certain range. So the cabinet itself does need to be not just heated, but ventilated. Uh, also, we need to consider the placement. It's better to have it shaded or underneath some kind of covering instead of in the beating sunlight because the sun, when it hits a cabinet, can definitely act like a greenhouse and it can heat up the inside. And when things heat up, they expand. The battery can get damaged. The buttons can pop out. So having a, a, a ventilated heated cabinet gives you the greatest chance of making sure your AED is ready for rescue. Um, we do get the question quite often, should we lock the AED cabinets? Is that a benefit? In our um, experience, um, and especially based on the information Deb presented and that we know based on research, time is crucial. So anything that prevents you from having the AED quicker, um, I don't think it's necessarily a benefit. So if you have an AED cabinet that's locked, um, you have to call 911, get the code, you know, it, it might just prevent the amount of time it takes, uh, make, make it longer to get that person the shock they need. So as of now, we do not have locked cabinets that we are promoting as part of the safe station um, concept. Um, in regards to liability, there is um, concern about that. I think that it's really important that everybody understands that in every province, uh, and I believe in every uh, state, they, they do have uh, good Samaritan laws that uh, protect a responder. So as long as you stay within the scope of your training, um, and you're you're acting in good faith, even if you tried to use an AED and save someone's life and they did not survive, um, you cannot be held legally responsible for that. You've done the best that you can do. Um, in, in regards to maintenance for the outdoor uh, AEDs, there isn't really any more maintenance than you would have for an indoor AED. The best practice that we recommend and that, that is an industry standard is that the AED um, is checked once a month uh, to make sure that it is still ready for rescue. Um, the pads and batteries need to be replaced depending on which unit, usually between two and four or five years, you need to replace those. Um, and when it comes to an outdoor cabinet, the monitoring aspect of it can actually help with, you know, checking that AED in between your monthly checks. Um, the only thing that you would need to do is that we would um, have a renewal monitoring plan that we could provide you with um, in four years. And uh, other than that, you know, making sure the pathway to it is clear if there's some snow um, and making sure you are checking the AED on a monthly basis. So um, for FOCA members, we're really um, pleased to have this partnership and be able to offer you all a couple different options here. Um, for some reason, the picture on the left <laughs> has disappeared, but I will let you know that that AED on the top left is this one. <laughs> the Phillips Heart Start on site. I don't know why it's it gone. jumped out of your Missing. slide and into yeah, your hands. It, jumped, it did. It's magic. Anyway, um, so the Phillips on site is um, they're all great. They all will deliver a shock if needed. There's just different things to consider. So an on site AED is an excellent AED for inside a home for a family. It's very simple to use. If you did want to use it on a child, there is a separate set of pads that are meant for children that you can purchase. The next AED that we have is called the Samaritan. So it comes in this little uh, yellow case. Um, and this one is also very, very uh, great for inside a cottage. It's a little bit more rugged. It has a, a higher, what we call ingress protection or IP rating to withstand wa water, jetting dust, jetting water and dust. And so this might be a bit better to consider if you're doing an outdoor placement in a cabinet or in um, a place where there is more water, let's say like on a boat, for example. So this is a great option as well. And the last option I don't have with me, but it's called the uh, Life Pack CR2. 
This one um, has a little bit of a newer technology. So the child pad, instead of buying a separate set, there's a button. So you press it and it switches to child mode. Um, and it is very, very user friendly. So we can definitely, um, if you are interested, talk uh, more about some of the features and really help you decide which is gonna be the best model uh, for your specific situation. And um, this would be an example of a mobile case. So we have them that uh, come in different sizes. You can throw this in the back of your boat, in the back of your car. Um, you can put that inside of a, a little uh, safe station hut and keep it you know, near a beach or near your, your waterfront. Uh, it's very, uh, very great because it protects the AD from the sun and also um, from water. So um, hopefully I did that within our allotted time and we have uh, lots of time for questions now. And Deb and John, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add there to what, what I presented, but certainly, um, yeah, open to uh, answering questions. Uh, awesome, Katricia. Um, Michelle, I'm wondering, do you think it's best then if we just jump into the questions just because there have been a panel that have, have I think in. that sounds great. I'm just going to jump in with our sort of holding place slides. Well, not if I jump in at the beginning, I'm not. Uh, and then I'll let Terry perhaps help us with uh, fielding some of the questions. Sure. Well, Michelle's doing that. That was great, by the way, Patricia. Really uh, helpful to see the on uh, like the live demonstration. That was that was great and uh, helpful to those of us who are might be worried about what to do. There was a couple questions somewhere about prices, and I think you already spoke to that. Uh, there was a question about needing to transport a person. Often, uh, if there's an ambulance on the way at the cottage, you have to meet somewhere. Uh, so there's just some questions about maintaining. Any thoughts about what that would uh, involve? Yeah, Tara, yeah, Tara, can I take that one? Sure, I read that question. And uh, I mean, I think it's a really interesting question. So basically, in the event that you had you have a defibrillator on you, then basically your best case scenario is to to it begin CPR immediately in the position you find them in. So you always have to get somebody on a hard flat surface. You you need to get them out of a bed. Um, you need that good backboard to to create a good effective pump, um, and then that you would be defibrillating right there in the cottage or outside, um, and you if in the end you had to transport somebody, you'd always have to stop the vehicle. Um, in order to deliver a shock because the, these units will actually pick up motion. So um, in that case, you really need to just focus on performing the CPR and using the defibrillator where you are and hoping that that will bring them back and then have paramedics come to you. Right, there was a, thank you. Uh, there was a question about um, if it will continually shock. I think you might've spoken about that. I, can you just speak to the fact if they've not, if they've not responded, you're just to continue CPR and then let the AED do its thing? Yeah, so the AED basically, it will shock once, it will tell you to deliver two minutes of CPR, and then it's gonna reanalyze the heart. And if the heart needs another shock, it's gonna say shock advised, you follow the prompts of the AED, press the shock button, and you could be consecutively, you could shock up to five, six, seven times, potentially in a real remote setting while you're waiting. But um, best case scenario is that it's one shock and it brings them back to life. But in many cases, it might take two or three shocks. So you just continuously listen to the machine. Great. Um, I think you spoke great right off the bat, all of you about uh, just the importance of knowing CPR and know the people around you knowing it. Uh, in the absence of, of an AED, um, we should know CPR. And I just was curious whether you do CPR training because I think you won't always have an AED present, but we all should know how to do CPR, I think. Is that right? Absolutely. Yes. Um, and you know what? It doesn't mean you have to come for a full day course. We have we have um, assets actually online that maybe we can share, Michelle, with you. Um, people, we do have even an online program that you could do. It could take you two hours from the comforts of your home and you could learn a little bit. There's nothing like getting into a classroom and learning how to compress. Um, but in the absence of that, there's definitely some good tools that we can point you to. Um, there's one video in particular that has over 21 million views and we've translated it into a whole bunch of languages. Um, Michelle, I think we'll share it with you and hopefully you can get it out to the people on this webinar. Absolutely. But it's, yeah, it's a really good resource to understand what are you really doing when you do CPR. So we'll share that with you. That's, that's excellent. The more people that know the better, especially my neighbors. Yeah. Um, <laughs> important. Um, there's a question about uh, people that have a pacemaker and whether that's an issue with an AED. Yeah, no. So a pacemaker, basically, a, a pacemaker is, 
it is 100% safe to use an AED on somebody that has a pacemaker. So what you would basically have to think about is that if somebody collapses and they're not breathing, that pacemaker, which was intended to set the rhythm of the heart, obviously that was not able to continue to do that. So um, the only thing you want to consider is that typically a pacemaker might be placed on the left side. Sometimes they can be placed in many spots. Um, you'll often notice it right under the surface of the skin. And then you just want to make sure that when you place the pads that they're an inch away from the pacemaker. Otherwise, everything else, you just follow the machine um, as you normally would. So safety to use. Okay, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, people are asking about the shock on the dock course. They're wondering a little bit more detail about that. How many people do you need? How long is it? How much does it cost? That sort of thing. Yeah, so... Um, Basically, we can take as many people as really you want. Um, it kind of just depends on the space. Um, cost kind of ranges typically between 550 to 750, depending on how far we have to go. Um, and, uh, and if we have a good instructor right in that area, so you can put as many people as you want. Usually they're between one and two hours um, and we can add in some other training too um, on other topics. But on average, it's usually about one and a half hour long. Because everyone right. wants to kind of get back back to the dock. <laughs> right. No, that's that's good to know. And you can tailor that, I guess, for for what people are willing to yeah. do and where they are, where they are. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Uh, there, there were a couple a of questions about the um, those pads and how uh, you know once they've been used, what happens, and then it, are they expensive to replace, or you said they might need to be replaced every two or four years. Yeah, so all the AEDs that we sell, we basically have a free tracking tool. So number one, we're going to keep an eye on your pad and battery expiry dates, and we'll let you know when they're about to expire. Um, second thing is, in the event of an incident, um, the pads do have to be replaced. We're there to support you from start to finish. We can download the ECG. We can give you a loan or AED. We'll kind of hopefully debrief because it's a very traumatic scene as well. Um, pads differ depending on what kind of unit, but they range between $65 and $100 typically, depending on what kind of AED you have. Are you right. muted? I'm, there we I'm go. I'm muted, of course I am. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there were some questions. You saw some, you showed some of the units themselves, and then you showed some of the save stations, which were really slick, like the ones they had in the public spaces. So you uh, was could you give some sense of what uh, the the actual the standalone units or the the what do you call them here this this the outdoor safe stations uh how much those cost to buy and install sort of thing sure Patricia yeah. do you want to jump into that one sure so there is quite a range depending on what you want to do we have um two really great packages for FOCA members that we've put together based on some of the interests we've seen so if you wanted to do something like a very um Oops, sorry, like this AED right here, the Samaritan inside of a ventilated and heated powered cabinet with an alarm that goes on the side of a cottage or a boathouse, um, something like that, the package is $2,600. So that includes the AED and the ventilated heated cabinet. If you wanted to add monitoring, the price does go up. Um, and then if you wanted to do something like an AED, um, then the prices were, we, we will send them out after the uh, presentation, but the AED itself, we have a, a special that's $14.99 for this. And um, the mobile, uh, the, the hut uh, that you saw there with some signage would be something like $4.59. So pretty affordable, non-powered option. Um, and then in terms of something like a monitored tower, the price does go up. And I think the, the top end is, uh, is around the $6,000 mark for that. And that includes a four-year monitoring plan. And so um, I'll just kind of talk a little bit about, um, because something like that, ideally you'd want to have a sponsor that would pair with that. And they could, you know, instead of doing a bus shelter ad or a newspaper ad, it's kind of a similar price to that. Uh, someone asked how are donors recognized? So on the tower, on the front and the back, you have a space to do a custom decal. So we would work with the, do with the donor. We would get their um, logo and some custom text. We create it and they would approve it and it gets printed and applied and it gets shipped um, ready to go. And then we also have some really great um, email material that we can provide like a template so that you can send that out and recognize the donor, um, send it to your cottage association list and recognize the donor that way. And also send out continually 
the CPR and AED awareness videos saying it is sponsored by the donor. So that's how they would receive um, recognition. Excellent. Sounds like a well-developed program. And I'm sure if people have specific questions about their uh, their unique situation, their location, their community, their facilities or whatever, that's why you're there and you can help them with their specific questions. A hundred percent. And it's not really like a one size fits all scenario because there's so many different scenarios, placements, people uh, that we, we really have like unique situations for everybody. So we'll be able to really understand what you want to do and help you do it. That's great. Um, I th thank you so much. I think there's a couple of other questions, but uh, in the interest of time, and um, I think you've, uh, there's a couple specific things about. Uh, Terry, can I mention what, can I answer one of yeah. them super fast? Okay. Yeah, the sure. question was, if someone has collapsed, but they are breathing normally, okay. do you still apply the pads and turn on the AED? So you would not do that. If somebody is breathing, you would stay with them, encourage them, keep them calm, call 911, maybe get the aspirin. If you did put the pads on somebody, but they actually were breathing and it was maybe they had just passed out, the machine is incredibly safe. So it will still analyze the heart, but it is physically not possible for it to deliver a shock if that heart isn't in, um, you know, a shockable rhythm. So they're very, very safe. You can't hurt anybody. Um, but I still thought that was an important question to answer. That's great. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And that is an important question to answer. I, I, might I want to answer one more question. I'm sorry. Sure, <laughs> yeah. about, uh, does the AD need to be charged? So the ADs that we have on the market in Canada currently, they all have um, pads and batteries that do need to be replaced. So the AD would not be plugged in. The AD is portable. And so the battery typically gets replaced within four to five years. And then the pads themselves, some AEDs have a spare set that come with it. Um, and when you use them, as Deb mentioned, you know, you contact us and we would help you replace those pads. So I hope that answers um, those questions for you. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to cut anybody off. Um, the, okay. This this summary is all going to be shared with everybody at uh, the videos and the additional materials that you mentioned. I might just throw in my one comment is that uh, as an adult hockey player that you should, there's AEDs all over the place. Uh, you should know where they are. Um, there's no point in keeping them secret. So if you do have an AED nearby or you need one, you should figure that out and let people know and figure out for yourself where they are. Just a thought. Um, so like I said, uh, thank you so much. We're going to share all this great information with everybody. Your contact information is so widely available and will be in all the materials. And I wanted to make sure that uh, people uh, knew that they could get follow up with you with any other further questions. So thank you to Action First Aid once again. That was fantastic. Uh, we'd this is part of our commitment to keeping our community safe along with our partners like Action First Aid. We really appreciate your expert opinion and advice and all the materials you've got. And we'll look forward to having a, another safe uh, summer ahead. Uh, so thanks to everyone involved in the presentation today and for everyone for joining in and do contact us if you have any further questions. So thanks everybody and uh, have a great rest of your day and great spring and summer. Excellent. Thanks all. Thanks. Thanks so Bye much. Now. Bye now. Thanks, Thanks for sharing Bye. your lunch with us. <laughs> <laughs>